which is thriving families. So we're thriving in Babylon, which means we're thriving in Upper Sandusky, our county, our state. So prayer is over our families and the uniqueness that God gave each and every one of us and how we're connected. So you have a nice little bookmark in the seat back in front of you that you can take, put in your Bible to remind you to pray daily for families in our community. And so it's an awesome prayer month as we not only begin school, but prepare for the fair and all the families that are part of so many things. That's awesome. And they're not just there to be prayer reminders. They're there for you to take. So take the bookmark, use the bookmark, pray those prayers, read the scriptures. It's an awesome, awesome thing. And we're talking about families and we're talking about September. That means the fair time is here a week from tonight. Um, next Sunday evening at 7 o'clock is, the, prayer, is the, the fair service out at the Master's Building. Make sure you bring your family, come and attend and worship with us. That's 7 o'clock next Sunday night, kind of the official kickoff of the fair. Awesome. And also, we are Helping Hands Meals. We still need volunteers for Helping Hands Meals to serve those on Thursday night. The sign-up is right outside of the door to your left at the featured ministry table. So if you would like to serve and help out with the meals on Thursday night, we would love you to volunteer for that as well. Absolutely. So as always, make sure you take time, read your bulletin, check the featured ministry table. That's how you stay connected to the things that are going on and the way that you might plug in to help serve God and his people. So with that... I think we'll greet one another. What do you think? Good time? Stand up and greet one another. Give everybody a high five. All right. Greet one another and then remain standing and we'll sing. Good morning, Trudy. It's good to be with you this morning. Stay and worship with us. Let's sing together. Go on and speak against my borrowed innocence. The judge is my defense. I'm going free. Right when the gavel fell, I heard the freedom bell ring through the heart of hell. I'm going free. I'm going free. All right, let's sing this together. Glory, glory, hallelujah. You threw Shadows in the sea. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Jesus is my liberty. I'm going free. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. All right, let's see. I won't go back again. That's just not who I am. Lord, I'm a brand new man. I'm going free. I'm on a narrow road. It's paved with grace and hope. It's gonna lead me home. I'm going free. I'm going free.
your love is my jail break i'm going free yeah amen freedom in the surrender when we surrender our lives to him uh, Christ exchanges that and we are find ourselves that we are more free than we ever thought we could be uh, and so today we we surrender ourselves to him we bring ourselves before him saying here I am here we are and we give ourselves to you God and so uh, let's sing these, this song together Here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me near, I'm desperate for Desperate for you, I surrender. I'm going to trench my soul, trench my soul as mercy.
Today we're going to continue in our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. And, uh, and so uh, we are reminded that just as we give back to God and we love Him with our time and our talents, we also love Him with our treasure as well. And so, uh, and so if you're new today, we want to give you a special welcome here and, uh, and just let you know that you need feel no obligation to give at all. But if you'd like, you can let the plate slide right on past. And so we continue in our worship as the, uh, as the ushers come forward.
that's our prayer today. Lord, heart of our own heart, that's who you are. You're our vision, God. Be our wisdom, be our true word. Lord, be our everything today. Be our all in all. We pray this through Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Can you have a seat this morning? Good morning. In the history of our church, hymn writing and singing was uh, one of the great uh, highlights of how we invited people to know Jesus and then follow Jesus. Uh, One of our great hymn writers uh, said, he who sings once has prayed twice. Uh, What great words this morning we sing as we prepare to open up the word and take a look at what God might teach us this morning. If you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to go there, follow along in the sermon notes. Uh, And we'll uh, put them up here as well. This morning, eventually, we're going to get to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Uh, That story comes out of the Old Testament, the book of Daniel. And we're also going to be looking at the last words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 28. And so you can use your bookmark to mark Daniel chapter 3 and Matthew 28. Uh, I want to say a word about how we study the Bible because there's nothing more important to us than understanding when we open the word that not only does God teach us about what happened in the past, but he intends for us to apply it in the present moment. And when we read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, it's the story of three men who faced a real trial, a real death sentence. And the intensity of that should weigh upon how we then look at how we apply it in our life today. That it's not just a a metaphor for a hard work situation. That it's not just a a story we tell to teach a moral lesson. That ultimately it's the story of what God did in the lives of people who really lived and followed him. And when we talk about the story of Jesus, I I don't mean story in in a fairy tale kind of way. That when we talk about the gospel message, we talk about the truth that God needs for us to hear. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego really got thrown into a fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar in a place called Babylon. Babylon is today in modern-day Iraq. It really happened. Jesus offers us eternal life so that when we die, we really spend eternity with him as opposed to the fires of hell. Not make-believe or fairy tale, but the kind of intensity that comes when we recognize that what we're dealing with is as serious as it gets. In our community here this last week, we had a high schooler, Gabby, who was killed in a car accident on Thursday after school. That kind of event can't help but shape what brings you into church, what you're thinking about as you come to worship. Uh, Praise God that uh, we know that Gabby was involved in our religious ed program when she was a fourth grader, which was not very many years ago. She went to religious ed and volunteers walked her down and then the teachers shared the gospel message and uh, the kids are invited to know Jesus at that uh, point. Praise God for Wyandotte Cares and volunteers who make that program possible for so many of our young people who would otherwise not get that kind of invitation. Praise God for folks at the library last week who called in and said, you know what, there are so many kids who gather at our library, so many kids here like there are everywhere who don't necessarily have parents who are at home or connected with them. And so praise God for Shane who said, you know what, I'll jump right on that. Went down on Tuesday this last week and sat with Gabby on a couch at the library as she was there by herself and lived the life of Jesus' love for her. The intensity of life and death is a good reminder for us as we worship today, as we go to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to remind us that it's not just how we entertain ourselves for an hour on Sunday. It's how we make sure we know what's most important in this life and in the life to come. So I want to highlight a few ways as we prepare this morning to talk about what do we do to to live out our faith. I want to encourage you, Steve shared, I want to share again about the fair service next Sunday night. 
Uh, We had a great response for our Sunday night service last month in August for the start of school. And we want to invite you to come back again for our community service at the Master's Building at 7 o'clock. And Pastor Jay from uh, the Mud Church is going to be speaking. The offering is going to go to the county fair board to support the ministry of the fair. Yes, the fair is potentially a ministry if you choose to make it so. If you choose to see your time at the fair and a connection with our community as the chance to be a witness for Jesus. And so the Honduras team has these t-shirts and we'd love to see folks wear these t-shirts as a matter of starting conversation at the fair. So if you want to help support the mission trip and uh, pick up the shirt that says love Jesus most to love others best, we invite you to do so uh, this week and then next week before the fair starts. Uh, And then if you want to do a prayer walk, a prayer walk was there too. If you want to do the prayer walk, uh, one of our other members said, you know, the the prayer walk around the schools was such a a time of just powerful reflection and prayer before God that you know you could do that at the fair too. So after the fair service, if you want to grab a friend or two and go walk the fair or go on Monday, on Monday it's free, nothing's really running, but you can go see what's happening. You can go prayer walk the fair service next week. Uh, The Sunday after the fair on September 15th, uh, you've got a chance to invite people then to hear the Children of the World Choir. And for folks who say, you know what, we we just need our people to see more diversity. We need our people to see what the rest of the world looks like. This is a great chance when the rest of the world comes to us. And so we'd invite you to come back in two Sundays to hear the uh, Children of the World Choir. Last year we had that great bunch with us. They'll be back again in two weeks. And it's a great way to invite people to come to church. You don't have to worry about how good the sermon's going to be or anything. You can just say, come with me, and you're going to hear a great great time of music and worship from these children around the world. And then in three weeks, we're going to begin a new series called Anxious for Nothing. Right? That's a Bible verse, by the way. In fact, the Amazon says uh, this verse out of Philippians is the most underlined verse in your Kindle. If you didn't know that Amazon knows what you underline in your Kindle, that's an important note. But uh, Amazon says this is your most underlined verse of of any book that they sell, of anything they make available. Uh, Anxious for nothing is the most underlined verse in the Bible. Uh, And some of you aren't going to come because you, you would prefer to keep being anxious. You like anxious. In fact, anxious is how you live. You're addicted to your anxiety. And so I want to tell you that for some of you, what what you're going to need is not a small group, but a sobriety group. Some of you are going to need a 12-step program to get away from the anxiety and the fear dealers on your television and your radio and in the world you live in today. Some of you can't imagine what it would be like to truly be anxious for nothing. And so I want to encourage all of you to be a part of a small group, to find a few friends, to say, you know what, maybe I need a, a recovery group. Right? Go ahead and tell some folks you want to join a recovery group and be willing to admit that your life has become unmanageable and turn it over to a higher power. To be willing to take a searching and moral inventory of your life and where possible to repent. And as a, re- as a result of the previous steps, having had a spiritual transformation for yourself, be willing to share that with others. Some of you who have done 12 steps and recovery groups probably have a lot more wisdom to help us through the next series we're coming to as we say, God, I want to believe your word. I want to be obedient to your word when it says I should be anxious for nothing. And so we invite you to do that. This morning we're going to continue our series which is entitled Thriving in Babylon. You can find that on Right Now Media. As we talk about this image of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Babylon, and this morning in chapter 3, we're going to talk about the experience of the fiery furnace. Now, I like chapter 1 and 2 a lot better. I like chapter 1 and 2 because Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego are obedient to God, and in their obedience are blessed, obviously and quickly. I like the idea that we can be an influence within our culture. I think there's a lot in chapter 1 and 2 that we should have learned from and that speaks to us. Praise God we don't live under Nebuchadnezzar. Praise God we live in a democracy where we have to commit ourselves to the leaders who serve over us. I'm part of a group that uh, meets on a regular basis with Governor DeWine, and so this week 
I have a meeting on Tuesday and uh, we'll meet him at his house and have prayer with him. That's a radical thing that our governor would say, I want people of faith to be a part of how we're governing the state that we're in. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't get that opportunity. They're not going to meet Nebuchadnezzar for prayer. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are three young men who've been taken captive to Babylon and have decided to stay faithful to God while being a part of the culture that's around them. In chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar has built a 90-foot statue and has told everyone they must bow down to it. Here's where you can use your bookmark if you're in Daniel chapter 3. And so in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high, about 90 feet, and six cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Everybody is gathered there. Every important official has been gathered so that they can see this amazing statue that Nebuchadnezzar has built and bow down to it. And when everybody else bows down to it, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't. There is a line that all of us have to draw in our lives, a place where all of us have to say, you know what, God, there are going to be moments where I have to figure out how do I cooperate? How do I walk alongside of people who don't know you? And Lord, where are there moments where I won't violate the laws that you've given? I won't cross those lines that you've given to me to keep me safe. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that was commandment number one, to have no other gods before me. And so while everybody else bows down, they don't. That's a hard lesson to learn. One of the reasons we need each other, one of the powers of the fellowship of the church is to remind you that you would have others who would stand with you. It's one of those things about us that we we really don't want to be left on our own. We really don't want to think that we would be all by ourselves in the face of all of that peer pressure. And so uh, our gatherings on Sunday morning, if you're a believer in Jesus, one of the things that you get out of this time is when we all stand up and sit down together, it's not just ritual. It's the practice of saying, God, I want to stand with your people. I want to be prepared in those moments when everybody else bows down that I won't be left alone. Praise God, Shadrach had Meshach and Abednego, and Meshach had Shadrach and Abednego, and Abednego had Shadrach and Meshach, right? Right? If you want to know how big a small group you need, you can do three. Three would be just fine. And when the time comes that the three of you end up in the fire, you'd know you're not alone. That kind of peer pressure is still around us today. It's not as obvious as a 90-foot gold statue. But I would tell you all of us have an enemy who is trying to pull us away from what matters most. And maybe that looks like popularity. or Maybe that looks like your paycheck. Uh, Maybe that looks like a a prestige. But at some point, all of us are tested to say, what is the most important thing in your life? Jesus would tell his disciples in Matthew 28 that all authority has been given to me. That Jesus would say, listen, there's nobody greater than I am. There is no one. There will be no king, no president, no person who is ever greater than me. And so if you have to choose who you're going to follow, if you have to figure out who's in charge of your life, it should always, always, always start with your commitment to Christ. Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had committed themselves to Yahweh. As followers of Jesus today, we commit ourselves to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That in that, God is at work in ways that we can't always fully see or understand, but would commit ourselves to say, when everybody else bows down, God, we're going to stand for you. Because of that, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to find a faith that was greater than the fiery furnace. Again, if you go to chapter 3 there, It says in verse 8, at this time, some of the astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever, and you have issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound 
of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and the pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Verse 12. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got ratted out by a bunch of stargazers. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had gained influence and power, there were people who were jealous and envious of them. And so even though Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not intend to offend the king, the result is that they've been given over to someone who, who now is furious with them. And I bet you some of you have been in that spot too. I bet you some of you are living lives that have made the right choices, have found yourself in a righteous place, have said, God, I'm going to serve you, and yet somehow somebody has turned that against you. That somebody has taken you to a place and said, you know what, I don't care how righteous you are. I don't care how good you are. I'm going to use that very goodness against you. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 11, if you want to write that down in your side notes, uh, 1 Peter 2, 11, Peter is writing to the church under persecution from Nero. And Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and exiles in this world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul, but live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Peter was telling believers in the midst of persecution while they were burned at the stake and thrown into the lion's den themselves. In the midst of that, live such good lives that even while they kill you, they'll see your good deeds and ultimately give God the glory. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are taken before King Nebuchadnezzar, who is furious with them. The men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego give a very short explanation. They replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. That was it. And I know it's hypocrisy for a preacher to talk about brevity. But there it is. You remember when Jesus was taken to trial and they asked him to defend himself and Jesus said, nothing? Boy, that's a hard place to let the Holy Spirit give you discernment to say, God, there are some places where I need to just keep my mouth shut. There are some times when I've done what's right and I've followed what you've called me to do, and in this moment of accusation and backstabbing, I don't need to defend myself. They said, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and if he will deliver us, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. What a great statement of faith. That's faith in the face of that fiery furnace. Whew, I want that kind of faith. I want to develop in us that kind of faith. We need to develop among ourselves that kind of faith that says when those hard moments come, Lord, when I'm faced with adversity, in those moments of challenge, Lord, I want to know that I'll have faith that believes that you are going to bring me out of it. But they continued, maybe even more powerful to their testimony, but if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. It's the constant temptation to say, God, I'll follow you if I'm successful. But then to be willing to go even farther and say, God, I'm going to serve you no matter what. 
I'm going to invite people to know you. I'm going to share about you even if it doesn't make me popular. I'm going to choose the right thing even if it doesn't have an immediate clear financial reward. I'm going to love you even if my reputation is damaged because of it. That's the kind of faith we are in the midst of developing. That's the struggle we're up against. Parents, it's why we want your kids to come to church, to find that kind of foundation. Young people, it's why we want you to come to reignite. It's why we want you to learn scripture. It's why we want you to develop in your faith. No matter what age you are, this is the key that we would come to trust what God has told us. Jesus would say, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. To obey everything I have commanded you. Boy, we don't like obedience. We do not like obedience. Right? Got a couple of folks getting married the next couple of weeks. I've done a couple of weddings. If, if you've been with me for weddings, you know we've taken a few things out. I don't ask if anybody objects. Right? We don't do that anymore. And we don't use the word obey. We just don't like it. It grates against us, especially in the marriage service when one person is supposed to and the other person doesn't. I know that's what gets me in trouble. I know. But this biblical idea of submission, this biblical thought that we are called to obey God and then within the community of believers to learn how to submit to one another for the glory of Christ is something that everything in us rebels against. And so we're in the constant process of inviting people to know, listen, you're invited to come obey God, not because it will make your life worse, but because it will make your life better. Oh, that's the hard place. The hard place is to come to have faith to say, God, I will obey you. I will obey what you have commanded because I'm going to have faith that it's going to be better for me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, we have faith that God's going to bring us out of the fire. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to break his command. To develop that sort of faith is a challenging thing. Always has been and always will be. But your question right now is, God, is that kind of faith developing in me? Will I learn to trust you no matter what? No matter what this life throws at me, no matter what tragedy comes, Lord, would you develop in me the kind of faith that would trust you to be anxious for nothing? All the things that Jesus taught us to do. Listen, you don't, if you're new here this morning, I'm like, and you're, you're like, I don't, I'm not sure I know everything that Jesus said. That's okay. Because Jesus didn't say, I want you to learn everything I've commanded you. He said, I want you to obey. Because we're supposed to obey, we learn. Because it blesses the heart of God and then somehow it works into our life. Uh, one of our adults told me this morning about her interaction with Gabby. Uh, she said her best time with, with this young lady, Gabby, who was killed in the car accident, was down at Stepping Stones Park. If you know anything about Stepping Stones Park here uh, in, the, in the area, that when the river comes up, it overflows its banks and the fish get out. And then when the river goes back down, the fish are trapped on the other side. And so if you're down there after a heavy rain, it starts to smell and stink and the fish lay out and it's gross. This adult told me that she went down to walk through the park and there was Gabby on one side of the walk where all the water ends up and the fish are there and Gabby was picking up the fish and walking over the top of the riverbank and throwing them back in. All there by herself, throwing the fish back in. And our, our person here said, I couldn't let her do it all by herself, so I went over and started to help her throw the fish back in until they were all back. And I think about Jesus calling us to be fishers of men, talking to those who understood what it was to find the fish in the sea and said, you know what, that same effort, that same work, that same desire you have, I want to transform it. I, 
I believe there's something in the heart of a young woman who says, I don't want any fish to be lost, that touches the heart of God who says, I don't want any person to be lost. I think it challenges us to say, God, make us fishers. Make us fishers of men and women, of boys and girls, of every lost person, because there's nothing that you want more than to see every single person come to know you. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. When you go to the fair and you walk past all of those people sitting on church pews, they call them benches. I call them pews. The fair is full of them. And people just sit there on those pews all around the fair looking for connection and love and friendship, trying to eat enough elephant ears to fill that hole in their heart. Greece is no substitute for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you walk around and you find those people who want somebody to say hello to them, want somebody to reconnect with them, want somebody to care about them. We get a whole week every year. They call it the fair. I call it pre-revival where we get to say, God, use me in this community with these people I'm with because I might not see them again. Which leads us ultimately to having faith in that fourth man in the furnace. Here's the, the event in Daniel 3 that makes it such a powerful story of God's presence. The three fellows, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, get tied up. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 19, was furious with them. His attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. He commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. And the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. That should be the end of the story. As far as King Nebuchadnezzar was concerned, that was then the end of that revolution. But it's not. Verse 24 then says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. He asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, your majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Three men went in, Three men will come out. But in the midst of that fiery furnace, even the king, even the pagan, even the man who would bring evil and destruction could see there was a fourth man with them. In your times of trial and struggle and challenge, in those most difficult times, we know that God is with us. As followers of Jesus, we come to believe that when Jesus says he is with us, always he means it, even to the very end of the age. I am always blessed by believers who want to share a testimony with me, and I'm always amazed when they begin with, I don't tell very many people this, or I don't really talk to church people about this, and they'll tell me, you know what, I felt the presence of God, I felt his hand, I've heard his voice, I've felt his presence, I made a decision, I can see clearly where he was at work. Where the people of God have this testimony in those moments of that fiery furnace where they say, I believe the only way that I survived, the only thing that could have kept me, the only way I knew what to do is because the presence of God was with me. That one moment can change your whole life. That experience with God. I don't know why Jesus doesn't show up with them beforehand. I don't know why he doesn't walk out with them. But what I know from Daniel is in the midst of the furnace, he doesn't leave them. And looking for that fourth man is a great description of our life of faith that some of you are in preparation and some of you are in the midst of that trial in your life, that challenge where you think to yourself, God, I know you're going to save me, 
But even if you don't, I'm not going to bow down and worship any other gods. That God, I'm going to take a step of faith. I'm going to take a step of trust for my kids, for my marriage, for the people I love, for the places I work. I'm going to commit myself to obeying everything you've commanded me. I'm going to learn to love and forgive. Lord, I want to pray. I want to know you. I want to start to read my Bible in such a way that it's not just a history book. Nobody goes to a recovery meeting because they want to learn more about sobriety. They go to recovery meetings because they say, I don't want to live like that anymore. And they share the trials and the brokenness and the troubles of their life. And in doing so, somehow, in the presence of others, God transforms that testimony and says, you know what, I'm going to help you in what you want to do. You're going to see your life look different. You're going to find a peace that passes all understanding. That's what follows, by the way, anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God, and God will give you the peace that passes all understanding. He will guard your hearts and minds in the knowledge of Christ Jesus, our Lord. That decision to say, Jesus, I want to follow you, is the most important decision we ever make. It's ultimately the goal of everything we do, every upward football game and every cheerleading practice, every reignite on Wednesday night and every Sunday night kids club, every Sunday school class, every donut we serve, every song we sing, every Sunday we worship. I don't want us to overlook the reality of life and death this morning. I don't want you to miss the invitation to know that now is the time to say, God, I'm going to stand. I want to follow you. I want to be the person you've called me to be. I'm going to put up a prayer in just a moment, invite you if you want to, to pray it with me, but you don't have to. If you've never prayed a prayer to invite Jesus into your life, there's no better moment than right now. And if you have questions and want to talk about it first, I encourage you to do so. But I don't want to take for granted that what we do here is just something that we'll do again next week. Because every day matters. I'll invite you to stand with me as we prepare for our last song, and as we stand, I'll invite you, if you'd like, to pray this prayer with me. So, Lord... Help me to stand for you. Help me to trust in you. Thank you for being with me. In Jesus' name, amen. I began teaching you this song a few weeks ago. I want to continue. It goes like this. If there's a grace when the heart is under fire, Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the wall Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire
for you this week because everybody's got somewhere. No, you don't go alone. So as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace from this day forward until we all meet again. Amen. God bless. Have a great Labor Day and a great week. Be another in the fire.